Good afternoon, everyone. It is two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today for our Tropical Plant Care webinar. My name is Heather Willis, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Program Coordinator for Franklin, Jackson, Perry, Randolph, and Williamson counties within Southern Illinois. During our program, we ask that you help us out by keeping your microphones muted and do not share your video. As you entered into the webinar, there was a demographics poll for you to complete. That is completely anonymous and just helps us with our programming data. At the end of the program, we'll have time for a question and answer session. So if something comes up during the program, we ask that you just type it in that chat box over to the side and we'll address those at the end of the program. Today's presentation is being recorded. And at the end, we're gonna post it to our YouTube channel. Um, our presenter today is Austin Little. Austin is a University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator, and he covers Franklin, Jackson, Perry, Randolph, and Williamson counties. A native of Quincy, Illinois, and a two-time alum from Southern Illinois University, Austin received his bachelor's degree in plant and soil systems with a focus on landscape design and a master's degree in plant, soil, and ag systems with a focus on horticulture science. Also featured in today's program is Clint Chamness, and Clint has served as the SIU Plant Biology Greenhouse and Conservatory Gardener since 2018. Clint is going to be joining us at the end of the program for the Q&A portion. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Austin. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to our program today. Thank you, Heather, for the introduction and for hosting with us today. And so if Clint is in the, is in the meeting, uh, maybe he can direct message you, Heather, so that we know he's on and we can get him unmuted so that if he is in the, the webinar already, he can maybe uh, hop in and give some thoughts on anything. And um, he might be with us for the Q, for the question and answer section at the end here. So, you know, looking at this photo here, it just already has a sort of calming and mood lifting effect for me. And when I was in, when I was in college, I always really enjoyed being in the greenhouses, not so much during the summer, but during the winter months in Southern Illinois, you know, it's just a, a really cool environment to be in when it's kind of drab and cold outside. And I think that in general, indoor plants kind of have that mood lifting and kind of kind of uplifting and, me and meditative calming effect. They're really kind of a nice, nice thing to have around. Living things in the house have a have a nice have a nice kind of cool calming effect. And uh, they're they're a living thing though. So there are things about them that we need to be aware of. So while, while they can be a really nice positive part of our environment, if they're not, if they're not healthy, if, there's, if they're suffering, if there's something going on health wise with our plants, then that can be a cause of concern. So they can maybe be a, a become a something that can be uh, not as uh, not as uh, fun to have if they're if they're in trouble. So that's really what I wanted to talk about today with this program, and just thinking about things that that we can look at inside as we go into winter here. And uh, a lot of people have house plants in their homes. Some people are are, are a lot more into it than others. But uh, today, this is really a general overview of some key factors. So it's just some key factors to to keep in mind and to, to, to be aware of so that we can keep our plants healthy and thriving. And the field of, of tropical plants is a very broad, deep field of interest. There's lots of areas of interest and concern. And so hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there will be some interesting good questions and I will do my best to answer those at the, at the end of our program here. So today we'll talk about those key fa factors. And we've also, the, a, a big part of this is going to be talking with Clint Chamness, the plant biology greenhouse gardener, 
about plants and how to keep those plants healthy, tropical plants, and just looking at some different features of the uh, plant biology greenhouse. So just to get started, what really makes a plant a tropical plant? So the plants that we call tropical plants come from a wide climate zone known as the tropics. And these are going to be located around the equator of the earth. And so the plants that we consider annuals or house plants in North America or the Northern hemisphere, kind of where, where a lot of us live, those come generally from this tropical region. And so in their tropical, in their tropical or native environments, they, they live year round in, in some way or another usually. Uh, but within, these, within this tropical range, there are of course a multitude and, a, and a, a, an amazing variety of different ecosystems and climates. And so there's been a, a lot of research done into these different ecosystems and the broad kind of categor, uh, categorization here are tropical rainforests. So those have no dry season. And that's where things like um, the kind of more leafy, uh, pothos and understory, uh, things, uh, philodendron, things like this, that's where we're going to see a lot of the tropical plants come from is the tropical rainforest environment. And then we have the tropical monsoon. So this is kind of an intermediary. So it's got um, a shorter dry period and a longer rainy, rainy season. And then tropical savanna, which is the largest category, land uh, ecosystem category, and uh, this is longer uh, dry periods with shorter rainy seasons. So the majority of plants on earth come from these regions. Uh, and there's at least 200,000 species that come from just the, uh, the tropical region. And the reason I have this on here, this may seem a little bit basic, but I just want to make the point that with, with uh, indoor tropical plants, whether they're in sort of an indoor landscape environment in a mall, a atrium, something like that, or if they're in our homes or, or, or a public space, these plants come from drast drastically different environments. So we're keeping these plants that are from these very unique environments in, in our homes, which is going to be a different set of environmental, environmental circumstances and environmental factors than what would be in their native range. And we're keeping plants that might be from the tropical rainforest and some that might be more from a monsoonal area all in, in these conditions in our homes. So we need to kind of be aware of factors of, of uh, what we can do in general to, to try to keep them thriving. And as I mentioned, um, these tropical plants, a lot of them behave more like what we would think of as evergreen. So they don't lose all their leaves at once. They kind of are in a continuous state of, of life. And um, some, some plants that maybe exist in a monsoonal area or savanna, they might have what we would think of as a dormant or kind of resting period. And, and that's where they kind of slow down their metabolic activity. They don't go completely dormant like we would think of as our perennials do in the Northern hemisphere but they might kind of have a slower phase for, for part of the year. So what happens in, in the home environment where during the winter we, we get shorter days, cooler temperatures, drier air a lot of times, um, it's okay for these tropical plants to go into a kind of resting phase or coasting phase where they're not very metabolically active. And this would be starting, you know, definitely, we're already into that phase now here in mid-December. So keeping that in mind, there are things that we can do to help them kind of go into that resting kind of period where they're, where they're just kind of taking a break, not really uh, actively putting out a lot of new growth, um, really just kind of slowly growing, kind of, kind of just hanging, hanging out for a bit. And so again, um, high, there's a high variability in these cultural, different cultural needs of tropical plants. So one that came from one region is gonna be very different than another, but keeping in mind a few basic factors, a few basic practices and things to keep an eye on, we can keep our plants happy and keep ourselves happy with our plants. 
And now we're going to take a quick tour. Well, it's a seven minute tour. So it's a, it's a good tour of the plant biology greenhouse. And here we'll meet Clint Chamnus. Hello and uh, welcome you to Terrific Tropical Plants. My name is Austin Little and I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And today we're standing here in the SIUC Plant Biology Greenhouse and Conservatory. So they have a, a really uh, expansive and impressive collection of some really rare, but also some very common tropical plants that you might find in, in the kind of home application or home setting. And today we're here with Clint Chamnus. He is the greenhouse gardener and he's going to take us on a tour and talk to us about some different topics on uh, tropical plants in uh, kind of the, the home setting and even some other kind of uh, uh, even more interesting kind of things about tropical plants. So I'm going to hand it over to Clint. All right. Thank you, Austin. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I've uh, worked here at SIU for three years. Uh, this is the plant biology greenhouse that's been around for 75 years. This is a hidden gem, I believe, on the SIU campus. Uh, not many people know this, but this is open to the public. Uh, Monday through Friday, nine to four. Please come in and uh, have a visit, walk around. Uh, it's a great place to get out of the cold of winter. Um, it's a great place to decompress. Um, and you're always welcome to come. I'd like to uh, start by talking about the main house here. Uh, this house was built in the 70s. Uh, we have three side greenhouses that were built in the 40s. Um, and in the main house, we, we have uh, plants growing in actual Southern Illinois soil. Uh, and you can see above us, we have bougainvilleas. We have four of those, which create a huge canopy uh, over all of our like lower canopy tropicals that we have under, underneath. It requires a lot of pruning, but uh, they're very, uh, very good at shading and protecting our lower canopy plants. Let's take a quick tour and see what we have. I just wanted to point out this time of year, uh, our bird of paradise is blooming. Uh, today's, uh, they've grown enough this year and collected enough energy to send flowers up. Um, this would be a plant that would be kind of difficult to keep in your house in the winter. Um, I think maybe possible, but but difficult. Uh, just wanted to point it out because it's really cool. So another part of the main house is um, that we have a lot of epiphytic plants or air plants, meaning they can absorb moisture through the air. Um, this is a bromeliad, which is very cool. Um, in, in the tropical rainforest, tree frogs actually lay eggs uh, inside of them. Uh, you can see there's water in each one of these. It holds water and that's where uh, tree frogs will lay their eggs. Uh, we have a lot of orchids up here. This is, a, this is a vanilla bean orchid. I don't know if you can see it through there. Uh, it's vining up. So vanilla beans are produced by orchids. Uh, it's one of the, I think, uh, per pound, one of the most expensive plants that, uh, that you could grow. Um, we've never produced a vanilla bean, but it takes like 11 years for them to start producing. And then we have other types of bromeliads as well, which are just air plants. These, are, these would be great in your house. Um, fairly low light, uh, amp, like kind of, kind of bright ambient light, but never direct light is, is ideal for those. So with the bromeliads and air plants, uh, the way that we water, the way that you water those, do you water, they don't really have roots traditionally. They, they can take up nutrients and water from their foliage too, correct? Yes, yes, they can. Um, I mean, for these that are hanging, like if uh, these are just masses of root, basically. So uh, I'll actually water them more often. Uh, I have several orchids in pots where there's moisture in the media and they do absorb through the roots still. Um, and those, those don't need near as much watering, like uh, very little every week. Like if your orchid's at home, it's in a pot, don't water it uh, very often. Um, but these that are hanging up here and uh, it does get dry in here a little bit, dry in the, in the winter, um, I will spray them a few times a week um, if it's a sunny day. 
And, that, and those are another great low maintenance house plant. And those, those you see those everywhere in the stores, the garden center. And so yeah. there's a lot of those that are probably being uh, given as gifts for Christmas and around the holidays Absolutely, too. absolutely. They're, and they are nice and low maintenance and mm -hmm. kind of are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty dynamic and, and functional kind of for, for the home setting. Yep. And uh, a lot of, I think a lot of people ask, why is my orchid not blooming? Uh, well, it takes, it takes a couple years and give it time and don't overwater it and it definitely will bloom again. And with orchids, I know there's tons and tons of orchids, there's thousands, but you know, once they, when they bloom, the blooms are pretty long lasting on a lot of them, aren't they? Yeah, very, very long lasting. Um, I'd say three, three weeks mm -hmm. to a month, probably for each bloom, if not longer. Very cool. Yeah. This is our south house. Uh, here we have a lot of cactus and succulents. Um, it's it's the southernmost house that gets most the most light here at, at the greenhouses. Um, it stays very dry in here um, and houses many many cactus. So this is our burn house. We we keep shade cloth over the top of it all year, even in the winter. All most all these plants in here are low light. Plants. Uh, ferns are a good low light plant to keep in your house. Um, with watering, they, they like more moisture. Um, so, so if you have a problem with overwatering your succulents, I would recommend maybe trying ferns growing those in your house. Um, they, do, they do enjoy a little bit more moisture. So this is our, uh, our north house. Um, in here we have herbs and a lot of stock plants. Uh, we do a really beautiful annual tropical garden outside the greenhouse every year and this is the main house where we have a lot of those uh, so uh, in the winter this house can be a little more difficult to care for because a lot of things in here do require a lot of light um, and don't tolerate drying out as well um, so winter time is kind of it's kind of rough getting through some of these uh, we do have some research going on like if, if uh, undergrads or graduate students want to do some research down here uh, they can rent some bench space. Uh, this is the house we use for that as well. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up our uh, terrific tropical plants tour here. And uh, Clint, thank you for having us at the SIUC greenhouse. It's it's really neat here. I'd, I'd like to spend all day here. So yeah. so yeah, just thanks for having us. And do you have any anything you wanna say about the greenhouse here? Um, yeah, well, thank you for coming and uh, utilizing the greenhouse. Um, I'd invite everyone to stop by and see it. Um, it's much better in person. Um, we are, we're open when SIU is open. Uh, so just come down and have a look around. Okay, so we do have more to talk about. That was from our YouTube channel, actually. So we do have more to look at at the greenhouse as well. But that was our general tour. So now we're gonna talk about some details and these key things to keep an eye on. So light, water, fertilizer, our growing medium or potting media that we'll talk about. And we'll also talk about disease and pests. That's probably one that people have the most questions about, I would imagine. But let's talk about keeping an eye on water. So this is maybe one of the most important factors with indoor tropical plants. And the general rule of thumb is that it's better to let plants get a little dry than to overwater. Overwatering plants, especially indoor tropical plants in the winter, can lead to stress, which can lead to disease and can make them more susceptible to insect da damage and predation, disease, and just general decline. So it's better to let them be a little drier than overwatered and too wet. And in one of these videos, Clint will talk about how he gauges when to water and the right time to water many of our tropical plants. Now, there are some, some gadgets like the uh, moisture meter, and those work pretty well, but if you've got a lot of plants, it can get confusing, I think. So it's best to kind of go by uh, hand feel, uh, feel the pot. If it's totally bone dry, it'll be pretty light. 
that might that's definitely a good indicator or if the plant is wilting. Um, and if you check the soil or the, the potting mix, a, a, a good kind of indicator is if you stick your finger into the medium and um, nothing sticks to your finger, that means it's pretty dry. If there's some particulates and, and soil particles that stick to your finger, that shows that there's some moisture in there usually. And so let's talk about sun and light. That's another really important factor here for winter indoor plants. So this, I think this illustration here shows it really well. And, you know, the most common type of light that we're going to have is between bright indirect light. So that's ambient light that's bouncing off of surfaces um, and not directly absorbing from the immediate rays of light from the sun. It's just coming in and uh, getting, uh, getting kind of that ambient light. And then medium light is a little bit further away from that, a little bit more shady. And then we have uh, low light where the majority of the light, it's still gonna get some of that residual light bouncing off of surfaces, but it's gonna rely a little bit more on uh, um, maybe artificial light is gonna be part of that. And so those are gonna be the plants that would be Probably um, tropical plants that are uh, adaptable to low light would be the ones that are going to do the best in most homes, especially mine. In my house, I really have uh, challenges with indoor plants just because I don't have a good south facing large enough window to get enough of bright and direct or medium light. Most of it's going to be medium to low light and it's, it's um, just uh, not enough light. That's that's the biggest factor there. So having having that nice, bright, direct, direct or indirect light will really open up a lot of options for plants, and it'll keep those plants uh, healthier throughout the throughout the winter. So then fertilizer, and that's another really important thing. And in general, something that Clint talks about in a video is, is that we want to really hold off on fertilizing in the winter months or, or drastically reduce fertilizing because we don't want to induce a lot of growth when this plant is trying to be in more of a, a state of, of rest or semi-dormancy. And just a, a word, another kind of thought on fertilizer. There are a lot of products out there for specific types of plants. So you will find fertilizers for specifically for cactus or for specifically for orchids or succulents. Um, and they're gonna have wildly different uh, concentrations. So when we look at a fertilizer concentration, we're looking at N, P, and K. And these are the percentages of, of that nutrient in the product or within the, within the uh, unit of measurement. So in a pound of, in a bag, that's a pound of, of uh, this product, it would have 1%, uh, if it was a 111, 1% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 1% uh, uh, potassium. So in general though, if we're looking at a 111 ratio, that's gonna be a pretty good ratio mix for the broadest range of tropical plants. And so a good general mix is 10, 10, 10. So that's 10% of each of those macronutrients in a blend. And these can be applied in a liquid or in a granular slow release form. Um, and I put 10, 10, 10 there. What's used in greenhouses is a 20, 20, 20. I think that's too high for most house plants. A greenhouse is pretty similar to what we're seeing here in this photo, which is the SIUC green wall. So this is a, an ideal, can, these are ideal year-round conditions for growth where it's an artificial uh, environment and we've got grow lights here, we've got a fertigation system that mixes water in with the liquid fertilizer. Um, and so it's the right temperature, you know, it's got, it's got all these things that we, that we can control and enhance to really keep these plants thriving. Now in a home setting, you're not gonna have all that usually. So that's why I would say generally, again, it's like with watering, less is probably better. You know, it's never a good idea to 
apply a bunch of something um, that we don't need that can that can cause more problems than uh, than benefits. So I say 10, 10, 10. And uh, diluted is better, I would think, in, in a lot of cases, especially during the winter. But there's really a, a good case to be made to not fertilize at all during the winter. And succulents, even, even less water and less nutrients uh, during, a, during a, the colder winter months when we have uh, shorter days, less light. And I think now we'll talk a little bit about air plants and epiphytes. That's a very popular common type of indoor plant. And epiphytes, they, they have evolved from living in these really dynamic tropical environments where there's a lot of vertical space for them to grow on, but not a lot of available resources on the ground. So they've created a mutualism where they grow on the surfaces of other plants. Uh, but they're not parasitic, so they, they don't harm the plant. And in some cases, maybe they even have some kind of symbiotic interaction there. But in general, they just use, uh, use other plants as an anchor. And so the roots are really used for, to, to anchor to, to a surface. And they get most of their, their nutrients and water and resources through trichomes on their leaves. And trichomes are like little hairs that uh, absorb resources from the air. That's where we get air plants from. And I have linked in the resources, which you will receive uh, with, the, uh, with the evaluation at the end, uh, some, some articles from some other uh, faculty at SI, or uh, U of I rather, U of I, uh, a really neat uh, article on air plants and a fun article on staghorn ferns. But in general, these plants take up their nutrients and water through their leaves. Now, when we water them with something like an air plant, we can put them in like a, like a shallow dish of water and almost give it a bath for a couple minutes to let it take up some water or run it under water for, for, a, for, a, for, uh, for a short period of time. Uh, with something like a staghorn fern, which is one of my favorite indoor tropical plants, or at least one of my favorite epiphytes, uh, it's, it's, it's really ideal to mount it onto something like a wood board uh, where we're putting, um, we're mounting it onto some peat moss and then, and then attaching that to a wood board. So we're not really watering the, uh, the fern so much as watering the medium that it's connected to. So, so it can kind of absorb from that medium, from that uh, peat moss. And during the winter, of course, we want to keep, we don't need to be watering it a lot, you know, maybe once uh, every couple of weeks, depending on humidity and other factors. Um, and they, they benefit from indirect sunlight. So thinking about that uh, diagram we looked at, um, somewhere in between two and three would be good. These can actually be harmed from too much direct light. Okay. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about some other options. What are some really good house plants that are low maintenance? And you may have some of these in your home, or if you're looking for more lower maintenance tropical plants, these might be some good options for you. Uh, the ZZ plant is, is a low light, low water plant. I think it's one that also kind of can have some air purification uh, quality to it. So that's a nice benefit. Boston ferns, historical plant there since Victorian times or before that, it's been a really popular indoor plant because it's really hardy. It's, it, it's a survivor indoors because it likes cooler temps and indirect light, which is in, in, uh, in the past and even now it's in homes, that's probably one of the most common uh, settings or common conditions. And then of course, succulents, cacti, aloe vera is another one that a lot of people have on their windowsill. Very, very low maintenance, low water needs. Uh, the soil can get very dry. Uh, it, it, depending on the medium, it may not need any fertilizer. Um, I, my family has had the same aloe vera plant in the windowsill for 30 years, and I don't think it's ever been fertilized, so. 
It's just one uh, quick case study, very easy maintenance. And so now we're going to talk a little bit more and, and get to check out some other things in the plant biology greenhouse. And I think this may kind of go over a few things before that we talked about, but it'll go into more detail. So this is our burn house. Um, and here we have lots of ferns, um, but we, we keep shade cloth over the top of it all year, even in the winter. Ferns are a good low light plant to keep in your house. Um, with watering, they, they like more moisture. Um, so, so if you have a problem with overwatering your succulents, I would recommend maybe trying ferns growing those in your house. Um, they, do, they do enjoy a little bit more moisture. So I see we've got some some dumb cane here. Is that a good house plant? Uh, yeah, it is. It, it does very well with, with low light. It also uh, can, can do well with drying out. You want to, in the winter especially, you want to uh, let plant let the plants dry out completely before watering them again. Um, they will wilt. Uh, you know, actually have some wilt from overwatering. I just moved that one out of a shady corner. And it's getting dripped in. So, um, if you have a wilty plant, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs water. It might have dried out at some point and then it's overwatered. So, um, if, if it's wilty, it's not necessarily dry. But uh, if the soil's dry and the plant starts to wilt, that's a good time to water it this time of year. Just let them let them tell you when they want to be watered. So sometimes it can be a, a case of over over attention. Yes. Yeah. Too, too much, too much water. Too much of a good thing. And then uh, oxygen leaves. Us, there's no room for oxygen in the soil, and uh, the plants suffocate essentially. So, um, another cool thing in here we have our cycads. We have three cycads. Uh, they're considered a, a living fossil. Uh, these cycads are you know, probably 80 to 100 years old. Uh, this greenhouse is 75 years old, and I believe when they were brought in here, they were, they were small, but uh, these take a very long time to grow. And so this is, these are very old, uh, expensive plants that we, that we house in here. Um, yeah. They're kind of museum pieces in a way. Yeah, in a way. In a way they are. They're, they're very, very cool. Uh, and they will produce cones, a big giant orange cone every year. It's uh, very neat to see it. I got, I propagated one. Now one question I had, and this is more of a general question for the greenhouse mm -hmm. and, and for people keeping indoor plants at home, uh, what, uh, what's the general temperature inside the greenhouse here? Right, uh, we, 70, 70 to 75 degrees um, is where we, want, where we typically just like to keep it. Um, tropical, most tropical plants won't die down to 50 degrees, but we don't want them to suffer. So we just, we keep it at a nice 70, 75. If you have ferns, you're growing them, them in the home, you could use uh, an enclosed terrarium, uh, which are amazing because they kind of just keep their own moisture in there and, and cycle it out. So you can water it once uh, a month and it would stay moist. Because um, this time of year, you know, we don't have high humidity and um, keeping, keeping a fern moist can be a little dumb. And a lot of, just in, ge in general, tropical plants, I think, but in here it might be a little easier to, to keep it more, hu it's probably more humid in here than it would be in a typical home. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, when I water in here, uh, we have steam pipes, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's steam coming up everywhere. Um, we have a mist bench for propagating, for making new plants for cuttings. Uh, so that's always letting off some, some moisture. Another cool thing we have in here are staghorn ferns, which, are, which is an in in epiphyte as well. We get the name because the, the fronds look like horns of a stag, which is, which is pretty cool. A lot of people love those plants. Um, in here we have a couple of house plants that I highly recommend for your home. Uh, this is uh, Zamia folia or ZZ plant. Um, 
you can leave these, these can take abuse. They can take overwatering, underwatering. This plant uh, is amazing. The only care would be like wiping the leaves every once in a while uh, to, to keep dust off of them. Uh, but you can leave it dry for a month and uh, it still looks like this. Uh, another plant is uh, Pepperonia. This is a Pepperonia. There are many different varieties. It's a great house plant. Uh, this one as well can take a lot of dry. It's actually barely wilting a little bit right now, but that's fine because it's winter, but this is completely dry. There is no moisture in there and the plant is still very somewhat, somewhat happy. It's on the verge of needing water, um, but it's a very easy one to care for as well. Okay, moving on. So those were some interesting plants that we looked at there and some really good tips on watering and light. And our next video here is looking at another house at, at the plant bio greenhouse, where I believe we're going to see a little bit more about succulents. So cactus, succulents, and things of that nature. So let's check that out. This is our south house. Uh, here we have a lot of cactus and succulents. It's the southernmost house that gets most the most light here at, at the greenhouses. Um, it stays very dry in here um, and houses many, many cactus. An example of uh, one of the easier to care for low light uh, plants to take care of is this pencil cactus. It's actually a euphorbia. It's in the uh, euphorb family, which is interesting. If you uh, break it off, there's always uh, white latex in euphorb. That's a characteristic of that plant family. Um, so this plant is completely dry. And uh, this time of year in the winter, it can just stay dry for a week or two and still look decent. Um, so overwatering would really be something to harm this plant this time of year. Um, but it would be something easy to care for in the house. Another example of a low light succulent plant uh, is Haworthia. Um, these, this is a huge plant growing in this tiny pot. It doesn't need very much water at all. Um, all these succulent plants, you basically want to leave them dry uh, in the winter for like two weeks. Um, depending on how much light they're getting, uh, but really they handle drought very, very well. Uh, so Clint, I had a question here. Yeah. I see what I what I think is an aloe vera, and that's one of the most common house plants I think that people kind of have on their kitchen windowsill. Mm -hmm. um, and is that another one that's more of a succulent and doesn't need a? a, a it's probably better to underwater it than overwater. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, it is. Um, uh, they're also very easy to propagate. Um, and they're very sought after. You know, they have uh, some healing properties. If you get a burn, you rub some aloe vera on it, sunburns. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they handle low light very well. And uh, you, you do want to let them dry out between watering. So kind of mentioning some of these tropical or succulent plants, um, that's one of these characteristics that might be more desirable for indoor plants in, in the winter in a lot of homes because there is that sort of uh, light factor. Things that require a little bit less light, so they're more shade tolerant, would be probably things that are easier to take care of in the home. And now with that, one other question I had is, what's a good way for somebody to test if, if, if a plant needs water? I use all my senses. Uh, touch is probably the main, the main one. You touch and see if those media is dry. Sometimes though, especially this time of year, and if you're using peat or, or if it's in sand, it will look dry on the surface and then below there's moisture. So sometimes I will use weight. Um, I'll pick, pick up the pot, see if I can feel feel it being heavy or not. Um, and another, another thing is to look at the plant itself. Um, even if there's some wilt in the winter, uh, it's later in the afternoon, you can, uh, you could let it go all night and water it the next day and uh, be fine. So it's hard to tell a wilt with a succulent, but um, yeah, definitely touch and wait would be a good way to tell. Okay, 
Thank you. That's that's, and I think that that's probably one of the things that people have have uh, questions about the most is is watering. So when should I water? How much should I water? And each plant, each tropical plant is going to be a little different. But mm -hmm. but during the winter, it's probably better to keep them underwater than overwater. Right. Well, uh, I like to think of succulents as like the uh, the lazy man's plant. Uh, you can really let them go. It's a good one. Uh, if you find yourself not having time to care for your plants a lot. Uh, in the winter, you don't want to water uh, at the end of the day. Uh, it's just moisture sitting on, on the plant and it being soaked all night. Uh, it's not good uh, for disease pressure. Um, so only water in the morning. And uh, for succulents, water several days after you think it needs water. <laughs> That's a great tip. Yeah, that's one of the big kind of factors that we got to keep an eye on is, is watering. And I and I suppose maybe now is a good time to mention fertilizers as well. Um, then that's okay. part, that's probably the other thing that people are curious about. Not what kinds of fertilizers, but uh, when when do we want to be giving a, a tropical plant fertilizer in the winter, or should we wait till spring? Right. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, well, you don't want to add a bunch of fertilizer in the winter. Um, a lot of insects and pests are attracted to uh, a lot of fleshy new growth um, or nitrogen rich uh, plants. Um, and if you add nitrogen, they're just going to uh, try to try to grow and there's not that much sunlight to uh, use up the nitrogen. Um, so you really want plants to go through kind of a pseudo dormancy in the in the winter, especially tropical plants. Adding no fertilizer for the winter would, I think, be okay. If you are going to add fertilizer, just do a blossom booster, which is uh, mostly uh, phosphorus, like high in phosphorus fertilizers. If you if you must fertilize, I would use those um, instead. Great, that's great information, and and um, the the kind of times to fertilize that's important. We don't want to be fertilizing in winter. Mm -hmm. And you kind of talked about the different kinds of fertilizers to use. Yeah. And 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 the, the important point here is to not put a, a tropical, trying to prevent a tropical plant, an indoor plant from being stressed. And so uh, fertilizing, overwatering in winter can put them into a, in the, into a state of stress, which is going to make them more susceptible to diseases, mm -hmm. pests, and, and these kind of things. So, so uh, we're trying to keep a, a plant kind of uh, uh, coasting and keep it keep it happy. Yes, yeah. Just keep it at one level, maintain it. Uh, we'll save the growing for next spring and summer. That sounds good. Very, very, very good tips. All right, moving forward. We're now quickly going to look at planting medium, which is another important factor. So planting media is going to be where our plants are directly existing. And there's a, a, a couple different ingredients we'll be looking at typically, and that's gonna be perlite, which the main feature of perlite is to improve aeration and drainage. That's really what perlite is mainly for, vermiculite. And what I'm talking about here, I'm going from the upper left to the right here, this is the white stuff, the perlite, the golden colored material that is vermiculite. And vermiculite is kind of like an accordion. If you look at it closely under a microscope, it's a superheated uh, mineral and it improves aeration as well, but it's really good at moisture retention because of that accordion structure. So, it, and it also helps hold on to nutrients in the medium so that plants can uh, have access to it. Then we have down in the lower, right hand corner, cocoa core or cocoa fiber, which is a, a bigger kind of structured material. And it's good at creating big air pockets, really nice quick drainage. And um, because of the a lot of that craggy surface, it has a good, it holds on to moisture decently well. But if we're talking about the 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 champion of moisture retention in, in soilless mediums, we're talking about peat moss. Um, peat moss is an organic material that holds a ton of water uh, and it slowly lets it uh, be available to the plants. It's also very good at nutrient retention and for a lot of tropical plants, 
they like a little bit more acidic pH, which peat moss does kind of help with. It, it lowers pH a bit. And so combining all these different ingredients helps to kind of cater to the specific needs of the plant. So we can kind of mix and match. And there are a lot of ready-made mixes available. So there's different companies that make specific mediums for orchids or mediums for cactus, so on and so forth. But we have a quick video here on mediums in the greenhouse. So here we have uh, several types of different types of media that we use here. Um, there are many more than this, but this is what the typical ones that we use. All oh, everyone's probably all seen this. This is a peat mixture. It's peat moss. Um, this actually comes from a moss bog. Uh, most of the United States gets theirs from Canada. Um, it's uh, a natural occurring resource, but uh, it, it it forms so slowly, like literally a millimeter a year forms from decomposing moss that it's considered a non-renewable resource. Um, there are def there's regulations uh, preventing us from overusing it, uh, but it is, uh, it's great for growing plants. It's just uh, not considered a renewable resource. So a lot of people will opt for coconut core, which is a very fibrous part of a coconut. This, uh, this has high soil retention. Uh, it'll hold like 20 times its weight and moisture. Um, so we use, we use mostly this for plants that uh, need, need, uh, need to hold a lot of moisture. Um, we mend our peat here, uh, so we'll add perlite, which is volcanic rock. And uh, this will hold some moisture, but hardly any. Um, so we'll mix this together to add more porosity, so water drains through um, faster. Um, there are some like hydroponic systems people might use uh, perlite in order in order to uh, grow in, in hydroponic systems. Uh, vermiculite is similar to perlite. Um, it's uh, a silica-based mineral that's mined and then heated up to uh, high temperatures and broken into different sizes and grades. Uh, this fine grade is actually more for uh, germinating seeds. Um, it has better uh, water retention than perlite, but uh, not, it's also, it adds uh, aeration and drainage to peat mixtures as well. So uh, there's bigger chunks of vermiculite that will help with drainage. Um, another thing we have here is coconut uh, fiber, which this also, we just add to soil amendments. Um, if I'm growing an orchid or bromeliad, I might use all, basically all this. Uh, in, uh, as a growing medium, like something I don't, I just want water to be on there, but a lot of air space, um, uh, yeah, a lot of oxygen getting in, we'll use that. Uh, and over here we have clay pebbles, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just clay heated up. Um, typically clay holds, holds a lot of moisture. These are dried and do not absorb much moisture at all. Um, so are very good for aeration as well. Um, so if I'm planting a succulent, I'll, I'll add a lot of these other amendments to uh, allow water to flow through and I want it to dry out quickly, um, as opposed to something I want uh, moist, well-drained soil in. Um, I'll just use mostly peat. All right, and our last topic here will be diseases that we'll look at. And just kind of, it's a, just a quick kind of tips on how to prevent diseases. And you might guess what we're gonna say. <laughs> um, keeping an eye on the environmental factors. So um, too much of something or not enough of something is, is really the key here to prevent diseases and then pest problems too. Um, again, the watering, light levels, uh, temperature, if we can control that by any reasonable means, um, just keeping the plant in a in a in a happy state to where it's not stressed out. If a plant's stressed, it's it's going to be susceptible to diseases and things of that nature. So um, 
the the con these environmental things are too much water, too much it's too cold, poor drainage, not enough light, too much light, um, things like this. And uh, the most common pests that we're going to encounter are going to be silids or uh, things with mouth sucking parts that are going to be sucking uh, the kind of the uh, juices out of the leaves. So the the solution inside the leaves is what they're after. So aphids, white flies, mealybug, mealybug scale, all of these kind of contribute to that. Uh, but most of them can be treated with a, a suffocant or some kind of a, a product that can suffocate the nymphs and eggs and even the adults to an extent. Or we can, if it's, if it's a small enough issue, we can clean it off a lot of times with, with uh, just a some kind of solution, maybe diluted uh, rubbing alcohol um, or, or soapy water even we could, we could use to clean off leaves. And I, yeah, I just put a picture in there of this is an insecticidal soap, a very common uh, product. And uh, the, the nice thing about using a suffocant is that it's, it's organic and it's pretty safe as far as, as, far as treatments go. But you still, if, you, if you're buying any kind of product, uh, do read the warning labels and do follow all of the instructions. One of the big issues in, in, in greenhouses and sometimes house plants are, uh, are pests. Um, I want to show a few pests we have uh, right now. Uh, the first one is spider mite. Um, kind of easy to tell uh, when you have spider mite because there will be webbing on the leaves. Uh, here's an example of this rose. Um, spider mites actually like dry atmospheres. So they come out more in the winter whenever the humidity drops. Um, even though we water in here every day, it's still less humid than, than normal. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but they're this plant is covered, this rose is covered and there's webbing all throughout the plant. So for care for this plant, I would cut out these branches that are bad. Um, and then at home, you can mix uh, of like an alcohol, like a cup of alcohol and a few drops of rubbing alcohol and a few drops of Dawn dish soap. And uh, you can drench this whole plant down like uh, twice a week. Until, the, until they go away. You just wipe them off, get them off there as best you can. You can also use uh, horticultural oil or uh, neem. Um, those, those are just suffocants. They, uh, you just coat the leaf and then it suffocates the insect. Uh, but also you need, for spider mite, you'd have to do that um, once or twice a week until they were gone. So they can be quite a nasty pest to get rid of. Another Greenhouse pests that we have here and or and your house plants will be affected by us are thrips. Um, sometimes it's hard to notice thrip at first. They're very small, uh, but there's a couple of defining characteristics of thrip damage. They puncture the leaf and create these white, these spots all over your leaves. Here's a good example here. So that's thrip damage uh, from where they've been sucking out the chlorophyll from the plant. Um, another Another sign is whenever a flower, this, a flower opens and it doesn't open uniformly, uh, that's a sign of thrift damage. Uh, this flower head is full of thrips. To get rid of thrift, uh, there, there are different sprays. I think uh, spinosad works, which is a derivative of um, an organic compound uh, that's, that's fairly, fairly safe for uh, people. You can spray spray there. Uh, if you are going to spray, take the flower off that's infected. Thrips love flowers. Um, probably this time of year, you might not have a flower at home, but you would just uh, spray the foliage. So you would want to spray uh, like every four to five days. Uh, horticultural oil will work for these as well. Um, just consistent spraying. Okay, so uh, here we've got an example of white fly here. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about white fly? And um, I see that on some of these plants, the white fly maybe also is uh, contributing to uh, sooty mildew. Yep, that's, that's exactly correct. Um, 
white fly are probably our biggest pest in here. Um, and they, they will take over a plant. Um, there's a lot of dead ones on here because I just sprayed them. But um, when they infest the plant, they will create honeydew, which is like a slimy substance. It kind of creates a shine on the leaf. I think you can see some here. It's starting to get some honeydew on there. Honeydew will be a catalyst for the sooty mold uh, to grow and form uh, on a plant. And so for this, uh, again, the treatments would, the, the kind of home remedies or home treatments would be horticultural oil, neem yep. oil, kind neem, of same thing. Neem oil, yep. yeah, and uh, just, just uh, every three to five days, you need to spray. Um, white fly eggs can live up to a month. Uh, they, they're, they're pretty resilient creatures. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then if you get, if you do get sooty mold, which, uh, I actually have an example right here. So, on the citrus, that's a black black mold. Um, so you can uh, spray spray them with like a uh, an alcohol dish soap mixture, um, and then just try to wipe it off. That's that's about about the only thing that I know how to get rid of it um, or cut it out of the plant. So these kind of uh, pest pressures and, and uh, molds, these typically probably won't kill the, the plant by itself, but it'll stress the plant out, which can probably make it more susceptible to other root rots, uh, foliage diseases that could kill the plant and spread to your other house plants. So it's something you really want to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah. You're, uh, all, the, all the insects insects carry the viruses and, and diseases from plant to plant. Here, here's uh, one more green pest I'd like to talk about, which is a nasty one. It's mealybug. Um, if you get close in here, you can see that most of these white uh, pieces are actually uh, an insect. All these pockets here are probably nymphs. Once a mealybug takes over like this, it's, it's difficult to get rid of them. Uh, mechanically cleaning, like actually physically wiping them away and cutting them out of the plant. Uh, and keep them up on that is about the only way uh, to really get rid of it. A suffocant or the, the horticultural oils will work, um, but typically just uh, some rubbing alcohol and Dawn dish soap and thoroughly spraying the plant and wiping it. Uh, it's a good way to get rid of it. Those are some great tips on how to how to kind of keep ahead of the disease pressure and and um, and and just keeping our plants happy and healthy and right. And, which, which in turn can come back to uh, uh, consistent watering and watering at the right time. Um, a lot of plants, I've let plants dry out so much that they, uh, they wilt so much that if you water them, they damage their roots and then they're sitting in wet soil. And at that point, uh, it takes a long time for a plant to recover. Um, they will, plants are very resilient. It's, come back, it's it's interesting what they can bounce back from and defend themselves from. And I think you mentioned that when a plant is stressed, they're they're more susceptible to insect uh, predation. Yeah. So insects are attracted to plants that are that are not as, as, as healthy. Absolutely. Um, I'll have a plant wilt, and then uh, the next day it's covered in white fly. So that's absolutely correct. So it kind of all connects to to making sure that all these different kind of factors are. We're trying to keep things in balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that just about wraps up our main program. And I wanna give a big thanks to Clint for having us over to the greenhouse and sharing all of his expertise with us and Heather for being our cinematographer and editor on this. Uh, it was a lot of fun putting it together. So these are some resources that you're going to receive through your email along with an evaluation um, for our program today. So please, if you, if you have a minute, fill that out. It really helps us out with our programming. And so I think I did see a question that we can quickly address from the chat. I was going through it and somebody asked about bringing house plants outdoors and indoors uh, throughout this season. 
And this is a great article from our Gardener's Corner periodical that's online. And uh, Ken Johnson, another horticulture educator, just put out a, a really neat article on bringing houseplants indoors. Uh, so say something like alocasia, okay, like elephants here. This would be a plant that lots of people take in and out. So um, you can dig it up, put it in a pot uh, in the fall before the last frost, or before the first frost rather. And if you have the right conditions in your home, of course, warm, light, you know, you can keep it inside. Uh, otherwise, it's more about storing the bulb. So they grow out of uh, tuberous bulbs. Uh, if you don't have the right conditions in your home like me, then you would want to be storing the bulbs in uh, some kind of uh, burlap or uh, maybe paper, like, uh, pa like a grocery paper bag, something like that with maybe a little bit of peat moss in there. And uh, you don't need to water them or anything. They just need to be in a cool, dark place till you're ready to pot them up in the spring. Uh, that's just one example, but I would recommend reading this article and it goes into a lot more detail on that subject. And Clint, uh, we'll go ahead and do the question and answer session. And uh, Clint, if you want to jump in and answer any of these, maybe. I okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, there was uh, someone had mentioned something about peat moss and how it, uh, not many people know that whenever it does get too dry, it can actually act as a water repellent and it's hard to get uh, wet again. Um, so that, that, that was something that I think that people should be aware of is that, uh, sometimes peat can actually get too dry, <laughs> which is tricky. Yeah, I can attest to that. Um, especially if you're using, uh, premix, like a pro mix or something that's been in storage and it's just bone dry, it can take a long time for it to take up water again and reabsorb. Or if you leave a potting mix plant outside during the summer and it dry, completely dries out, it, it never really, it seems it never really takes up water again like it should. Yeah, yeah, it can be difficult sometimes. Hmm. Clint and Mm -hmm. Austin, did you guys see the message that just came in uh, about pathos plant leaves turning yellow before they mature and it happens with their larger leaves? Can you speak to that? Uh, well, I mean, I would have to see the soil. Does the soil seem too wet or too dry? Um, that's usually the first issue, the first thing that I look at. Um, so you can take the plant out of the pot and check the soil. And if it's very soggy, maybe smells bad, uh, that could be your reason. Um, also, like some plants naturally do drop leaves. Uh, so sometimes it can be a natural yellowing. But with the new, with the new growth, uh, it seems to be maybe there's some uptake nutrient uptake issues that could be caused by watering. And I think you've been all over the Q&A already. So I think we've addressed most of them. One that may not have been um, mentioned is, are ladybugs good to have around plants? Yeah, ladybugs are, uh, they kill some harmful uh, insects. Um, I can't, they're predator insect. I don't remember specifically what they eat, but I don't think that they are uh, a, a bad thing to have around. They're definitely a predator insect. I'm just not, I'm not sure if they eat thrip or what they actually fight. Clint, I, I think the, one of their main, uh, one of their main targets is aphids. So they're, they're good for aphids. Now indoors though, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to release a bunch of ladybugs. However, a lot of times in fall, they end up inside your house anyway. So Maybe that's yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't mind them. I don't mind wasps as well. <laughs> wasps, I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure about. That's, <laughs> that's a bit, that's a step, that's a further yes, step. Yes, yes. So another question. Maybe oh, I'm sorry, Austin, go ahead. 
ahead. I was going to say another question that came in is someone said they have scale on the shoots of their spider plant. Um, they wipe them off with alcohol. Should that take care of it? Hmm. Well, it's. Uh, I think it'd just be consistent. You'd have to consistently remove them and 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 wipe them clean. Um, sometimes if the new growth maybe looks looks pretty good and you can rip off like spider plants are pretty strong plants you can maybe rip off uh, the outer leaves the infected leaves and then keep wiping the the newer growth uh, that's possible or um, as easily propagated as they are you know with the new spider plant with the pups that come off the side maybe just start the plant over um, and get rid of the, the main one I, I would I would second that. I have dealt with scale on a plant called Bird's Nest, which is an epiphyte indoors, wow. and the the fronds or the leaves that were the worst, we just removed them. But we also tried wiping with alcohol solution, and with that, we also tried using horticultural oil uh, every two weeks, I think. And it, it does get some control, but this was on our green wall. So there's so many places for the uh, the nymphs to go, the the you know the the re, the their reproductive stage is when they're in the in the scale form. But the the uh, larvae or the nymphs move, so that's what you really want to try to control. But those can be anywhere, especially on a green wall. So a combination of things, wiping them off, using that suffocant to kill them, suffocate them, all of those. And then uh, something to think about is if a plant is just really in rough shape it's, it, and you want to try to quarantine it from your other plants, it's best to probably just remove it. Mm -hmm. So another question that came in, someone said that they had a house plant that needs repotted, but they know that it's not recommended in the winter. So do you recommend just to wait until spring to do that? Um, yeah, it depends on maybe the house plant. And if it seems to be doing okay, I would wait just because it's easier whenever there's more growth. Um, but but if, it's, if you're watering it, you know, if it's not holding moisture and you need to, uh, you can pot it up. I would just be very careful about not watering it again um, but if it seems to be doing okay, I would just leave it until it starts to warm up. Yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely second that. So I think you guys have addressed everything that came in, unless anyone has any last minute questions that they want to drop in the chat box. I know there was a question about the common name and the spelling of the plants that we talked about. So that's something that Austin, Clinton, and I can talk about and make sure that we get that in the list of resources when we send that out at the end. Is there any other closing thoughts from you guys that you wanted to share with us? Um, I don't think so. I think we pretty much covered the, the basics. Maybe if you plan to give a gift of a plant to somebody, give them a, 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 a you know, instructions. <laughs> maybe, maybe send them to this video. So uh, but now, other than that, I think that's it. Thank, thanks for joining us today. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And when we send the follow up, we'll also have a link to the YouTube channel that has all of the videos that were featured in here. And if you guys want to subscribe to it, we have all kinds of content that's on there uh, in other areas that's interesting. So we'd love to have you subscribe and uh, be part of our extension to family. Here. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.